you recall, upwelling brings nutrient-rich water up towards the surface, and particularly in nitrate-depleted oceans. So it's bringing nitrate up to the surface in places that were otherwise previously nitrate-depleted. Where did that nitrate go originally? Well, the phytoplankton took it up. When they run out of nitrate, they quit growing. But now that nitrate's present, and if there's sufficient light present, it stimulates a bloom of phytoplankton. Of course, that stimulation of the bloom in phytoplankton, particularly diatoms, stimulates increased activity of, of zooplankton. So zooplankton will swarm and aggregate and begin to increase in numbers as well. And as we have more of zooplankton or bivorous zooplankton, of course, we have more planktivores and the whole food web begins to flourish. As we have increases in primary productivity, we're going to get increases as well in particulate organic, particulate organic matter, dissolved organic matter, and dissolved organic carbon as phytoplankton leak during their regular metabolic processes as sunlight or photolysis kills phytoplankton and they leak out their contents and certainly as zooplankton feed upon them and zooplankton excrete and get rid of fecal pellets and all those kinds of things. You can go back to chapter 13 if you're a little bit weak on understanding these kinds of things but the point here is that as primary production is increased as the phytoplankton and the diatoms in particular are now fueled by nitrate, the microbial food web is also going to start spinning up as well because it's those increases in palm, dom, and dock that stimulate the growth of bacteria. In turn, that stimulates the growth of bacteriovores and predators. And so the microbial food web gets going as well. And then, of course, as diatoms absorb all that nitrate and as nitrate becomes limiting again, well, then the phytoplankton growth is going to slow down and then the whole food web is going to slow down and then there will be back to the sort of microbial food web. So we go transitioning from nitrate depleted conditions in which we ha probably have a very good functioning microbial food web, nitrate rich conditions when we get that upwelling and then it makes the classical food web flourish and then as that system dies down we return to those sort of steady state conditions that favor the microbial food web. Let's take a look at a figure that illustrates all of that. This is figure 1410 from the book and this is again one of those figures where a picture is worth a thousand words, perhaps even more than a thousand words. There's several different things I want you to pay attention to in this figure and so go through this slowly with me. Two things are important. One is in upwelling systems we have a variation in space from where the water is being upwelled to as it's carried offshore different stages of the upwelling ecosystem will be present so of course if we're if we're looking down at a satellite image of upwelling and if you go back to chapter 8 when we talked about upwelling um, or perhaps both in chapter 9 as well and we looked at those satellite images of upwelling and those shreds of water being um, upwelled offshore if you take just from the shore towards the ocean or out towards the middle of the ocean each one of those different segments will represent one of these different what we call zones of upwelling so again upwelling systems vary in space of course they also vary in time because from the onset of upwelling you have all the processes that we just talked about the stimulation of the classical food web where the classical food web reaches its maximum biomass where the classical food web um, begins to transition down as the microbial food web begins to come back and then as we go back to our original conditions okay so that's an overview of spatial and temporal variability in an upwelling system. Let's go through the steps one more time. As winds blow from the north in California, we generate offshore transport of water, Ekman transport. It brings cold, nutrient-rich water towards the surface, and that water begins to mix with some of that water that was previously at the surface. It 
importantly brings nutrients and especially nitrate into the photic zone. As a result, phytoplankton begin to shift up. They begin to change their metabolic machinery from what was previously kind of a survival mode. Now they're in their growth mode because now nitrate is present. So it's called what we call a shift up of the classical food web. As this water continues to be transported offshore, it's also now carrying those phytoplankton that have begun to grow and reproduce. And again, at some distance from the shore and at some time subsequent to the onset of upwelling, so again, we're representing time and space here, the phytoplankton will reach, reach their maximum biomass. They will begin to sediment out, they begin to sink out, organic matter will begin to sink out, at the same time, this organic matter will then begin to be fed upon by other organisms or broken down by bacteria and so on and so forth. We have a, so in a sense, we now have sinking and sedimentation of organic matter. So upwelling systems also include a geological component. In fact, in upwelling centers, we find them very rich with organic sediments. Continuing on here from where phytoplankton reached their maximum biomass, then of course, they're being fed upon by zooplankton, and the zooplankton reach their maximum biomass. So if you remember some of the figures that we talked about in um, Chapter 7 and, and when we talked about phytoplankton and zooplankton in Chapter 13, we saw that as the phytoplankton grow, soon following that is a peak in zooplankton abundance. So you should be imagining those graphs as you're looking at this transition again. This is later in time, this is also further offshore, and the zooplankton begin to reach their maximum biomass. Of course, zooplankton are also producing organic particles in the form of fecal pellets, and they're also excreting ammonia, and perhaps even excreting um, dissolved organic material. So all of this stuff um, feeds into lower depths and feeds into abyssal depths and has implications for other food webs as well. About this time, the phytoplankton have depleted all the nitrate in the surface waters. Okay, upwelling, we can assume at least as this water is moved offshore, it's going to get depleted in, in nitrates. If upwelling shuts down, this water will continue to move offshore, of course, but once we cut off the source of nutrients, we shut down this whole process. But as phytoplankton absorb all the nitrate and go once again into a nutrient limited condition. Their numbers decline, the zooplankton numbers decline, and the microbial food web begins to take over. All the dissolved organic matter and dissolved organic carbon and particular organic matter that's left over as a result of this flurry of activity in the classical food web is now going to be taken up by the microbial food web the microbial food web will have a burst of activity and probably an increase in numbers um, in a sort of transitional way and then eventually go to a low nutrient steady state microbial food web again as that water uh, moves offshore and the situation returns in essence to what it was before we had the upwelling. So there's a lot in here, and I ex do expect you to be able to describe all these different stages because you've learned all the different factors that go into creating phytoplankton. You've now learned as well all the kinds of controls on food webs that lead to transitions of uh, transfers of energy and matter from lower trophic levels to higher trophic levels. And we could have even put predators in here as well. So this figure you should be able to understand to some extent and I encourage you to read the parts in the book I encourage you to explain this figure to a friend I encourage you to write out what you the different sequences and the different explanations for the different sequences the different zones in this figure because it just might be something you're asked to do come final time because if you know this you know oceanography and that what better proof is there